Conservative leader Pierre Poiliev pictured here remembering that nothing makes a politician seem more trustworthy than this gesture. It's never turned out badly. Anyways, I've got a quick question for Pierre. What's he doing for Pride Month? You see, every other leader of a federal political party attended a Pride Parade. He sent his deputy leader, Melissa Lanceman, to a pride flag raising, but he has attended absolutely no public pride events for the entire month. Now, of course, he claims to be a friend to the 2 LGBTQIA plus community, even though he sided with the whole parental rights thing that was completely made up when it comes to schools and pronoun rules. But every other major political party leader confirmed that they will either be attending or have attended a pride event. Jigmeet Singh is walking in pride this weekend. Justin Trudeau is attending pride events throughout the country. Yves-Francois Blanchet and Elizabeth May have both attended gatherings. So where's Pierre? I think it's really notable that he is not showing up to show any level of support for the 2S LGBTQI plus community. Like, he insists that he's not going to discriminate or mistreat anybody, but he's the only one not showing up. And I think what he doesn't do says just as much as what he does. Federal Environment Minister Stephen Gilbo pictured here dressed head to toe in purple like a comic book villain. His evil powers are going to come in any time now. Anyways, he is finding himself at the center of perhaps the silliest story I've heard in Canadian politics in a while, and that's really saying something. You see, he was overheard on the phone speculating about the future of the Liberal Party and Justin Trudeau's reign as leader. How did the conversation get leaked? Because he had it in public sitting next to a prominent Canadian columnist, Justin Ling just didn't realize he was sitting in a train station next to a journalist talking about a potential coup within the Liberal Party. It's a common whoopsie. So yeah, Ling was sitting in the Via Rail business lounge and Stephen Gilbo sat next to him. And they talked about the leadership crisis within the Liberal Party. Like Gilbo said, quote, if we're not trying to address this, it will fester. So this conversation needs to happen whether we want it to or not. Which isn't necessarily wrong, but probably not something to be talking about in public. But it appears that Gilbo was meant to be taking the temperature because he's, quote, been asked by the PMO to make some calls and talk to people and report back. But it appears that there's significant frustration within the Liberal Party, and the party doesn't really know what to do. Like, Gilbo warns that there could soon be a, quote, campaign to show Trudeau the door. Now, of course, Gilbo responded by saying, quote, I ran to be a member of Parliament in 2019 because I believe in the Liberal Party and the Prime Minister's tireless and progressive leadership. And one-sided conversations taken out of context do not reflect the open and honest exchanges that I routinely have with my caucus colleagues. Moral of the story, I got caught. Whoops. So to be clear, this is all just rumor and innuendo. One side of a two-sided conversation was heard. And the article's pretty clear on that, to be fair. But it does make it incredibly clear that there is serious dissent within the Liberal Party. And they know. And they don't appear to really have much of a plan to deal with it. Other than having awkward conversations about it in public places. Nailed it, Steve. Yet again, reminding us of the fiendish mastermind that is Stephen Gilbo. Just so bad at this. Vancouver Mayor Ken Sim is a busy man. He's got a lot going on, and as a result, he's made some renovations to Vancouver City Hall. You see, he took a boardroom and turned it into a gym. Like, he just straight up emptied out the Grouse boardroom at City Hall, which is directly adjacent to the mayor's office, and turned it into a personal gym. He put in a Peloton, a dip rack, and a couple other things. Now, of course, Sim insists that his Mojo Dojo Casa house is perfectly fine, because it was so important for him to maintain his health. So specifically, Ken Sim took over two different rooms on his floor, the ceremonial boardroom and the Grouse room. Now, it was never explained what they were taking those over for. The doors were just locked. But on Friday, Pete Fry, a city councillor, saw that the door to the grouse room was left open and saw that it was just a gym. Like, this used to be a place where city councillors did city business, where there was delegations who had meetings. It's been taken over for regular operations, which is just a gym. And he also took over the ceremonial boardroom to make it his office. So he's taken over two different rooms to give himself a mega office, a full-size office, and a gym with a direct entrance. Like, there's a door between the two. Now, of course, he insists that the boardroom was moved to, quote, ensure privacy and efficiency. But in reality, dude just wanted a gym. Like, he has three desks in his big office that he's taken over. One standing, two seated. Two couches, a flat screen TV, and street signs as wall art. Also, magnificently, he's got books including The Bitcoin Standard and Arnold Schwarzenegger's Autobiography. Amazing. 
But like, they claim that this is about improving privacy and access, when in reality, the lack of that room is causing serious problems. Staff used to use that room before they presented to the mayor and city council. Now they're just stuck sitting in a line of chairs outside council chambers. The privacy is gone. But also, there's already a gym at City Hall! There's a fitness center in the building! Ken Sim just wanted a private place to spin on his Peloton. Like, this is ridiculous. And rather than say, I'm sorry, this was a bad call, he spun on his Peloton in front of journalists. Yeah, that'll fix things, Ken. Great plan. No flaws. I want to take a minute to talk about this Ipsos poll that's been doing the round, because it is incredibly misleading. It's been circulating claiming that 70% of younger Canadians claim that Canada is broken. And it highlights a bunch of terrifying information about how much everybody hates Canada. Because 35% of Canadians, compared to five years ago, are less likely to feel proud to be Canadian. 32% less likely to attend Canada Day Festival. 28% less likely to display Canadian flag. 27% less likely to speak positively about Canada to those not from Canada. And 20% less likely to learn more about Indigenous history in Canada. So let's talk about this for a second. For starters, the survey question was, specifically, Pierre Poilievre recently said that Canada is, quote, broken. To what degree do you agree or disagree with this statement? Right out of the gates is letting Pierre Poilievre frame the conversation. It's adding a political spin to it immediately. It's a push-pull. It is nudging people towards a preferred answer, and it's incredibly deceptive. But also, why are people taking offense to this? It is an accurate reflection of the state of things in Canada right now. People are struggling. Wages are falling behind. People can't afford housing. We have overdose crises. Crime is on the rise. There are a bunch of things going badly in Canada right now. Why is it so wrong to have a frank conversation about that? But also, there's one very important thing I want to highlight here. I don't display Canadian flags anymore, and most of the folks I know don't display Canadian flags anymore either. Do you know why? Because the meaning of a Canadian flag has changed. If you used to have a Canadian flag on the side of your car, I used to think, well, what a patriotic individual. Now I think that person is likely incredibly obnoxious, and likely has appalling political views. Like, the Canadian flag has in no small part been co-opted by extremist groups, making it hard for ordinary folks to just rock a Canadian flag around Canada Day, without feeling like they're somehow identifying with the folks who wave those flags all the time from their gigantic trucks. Well, they set up their convoys and the like. A controversy surrounding Canada's new human rights chief really illustrates how this country is completely unable to have a rational conversation. So this story centers around somebody named Birju Datani. He's the new chief commissioner of the Canadian Human Rights Commission, but he's being criticized for claims that he made in 2015. So while he was taking graduate studies in England, he discussed terrorism. Specifically, he was presenting academic research on the effectiveness of it. And his findings showed that, quote, contrary to conventional wisdom, which is far more convention than it is wisdom, terror is not an irrational strategy pursued solely by fundamentalists with politically and psychologically warped visions of a new political, religious, or ideological order. It is in fact a rational, well-calculated strategy. It is in fact a rational and well-calculated strategy that is pursued with surprisingly high success rates. Now, I want to be really clear, that is in no way an evaluation of terrorism's value or quality. That is a factual assessment of its effectiveness, and who pursues it. At no point did he claim it was good or right or acceptable. He is observing that it has been an effective approach taken by some groups, and that it is not exclusive to extremists. That's it. But obviously, a bunch of folks are calling for him to resign over this. How dare he have an authentic discussion about a complex topic? Hot takes only, damn it! Like one advocate said, quote, How can you have a human rights commissioner who thinks that terrorism is a rational strategy? Because we need a human rights commissioner who will think about things objectively, rather than just jumping to their own assumptions. Like, he did research on the matter and came away with conclusions. What's your problem with that? Like, this is just trying to police the conversations around things like terrorism. To say that we will only accept the conclusions that we have already leapt to. Anybody who reaches other conclusions needs to be immediately disqualified from the conversation. Like, what specifically is the claim that people take issue with here? Like, assuming that terrorism is rooted in deeply irrational beliefs hasn't really gotten us anywhere. Terrorism continues. So how about an effort to actually understand the nature of it, instead of just dismissing it as irrational out of hand? But apparently, wanting to have a rational conversation is disqualifying from the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Who knew?
This person's taking part in something called a false equivalency. You see, I criticized Pierre Poilievre for not attending any Pride events. And this person said Justin Trudeau didn't attend their breast cancer golf tournament. So clearly those two things are equal. No. You see, people with breast cancer aren't being actively systemically discriminated against. There aren't anti-breast cancer hate movements. The rights of people with breast cancer aren't under constant threat. The two things are not equal. Both are important, both matter, but they're not the same. Why are you treating them as though they are? Like, this is just such an obvious misrepresentation. Like, does anybody actually believe that Justin Trudeau is pro-breast cancer? Really? Do you think him not attending that event is an automatic stance of his beliefs? But what if he chose not to attend, I don't know, dozen events nationally, in the middle of ongoing attacks against the rights of those people? Then it'd be sending a pretty clear message. Like, this is just trying to muddy the waters. And it's entirely because you want to excuse Pierre Poilievre's behavior while turning the blame against Justin Trudeau. Stop it. This person's claiming that Canada's broken and the left broke it. Cool. By what measure? Which specific leftists have broken Canada? Because most of the issues that are happening are at a provincial level, and most of the provinces are run by conservatives. Like, which leftist is messing up Saskatchewan? Scott Moe? What a commie. But also, to be a leftist is generally to identify as either a socialist or a communist. Which politicians in Canada identify as socialist or communist? Which leaders in Canada identify as socialist or communist? Or have socialist or communist policies? You know, the ones that affect the relationship with the means of production, causing workers to own factories, or nationalizing different industries. When has that happened? Or are you just complaining about social programs? That's not leftism, that's just taking care of people. Like, Canada doesn't really have an active political left, at least not electorally. We have the liberals, who are right of center, if not centrist, and the NDP, who are just like a slight step to the left of them. Very slight. So who are the leftists that you're blaming? Be specific. Oh my god, will some people please put down the false victimhood? This person's talking about pride events and saying people are sick and tired of these events being forced on them. Please, be very specific about when you've been forced to participate in Pride. Like, did they just round up people in your town and make a march? Or is it just an event that's happening in your town and you're mad about it? Like, participation is not forced. You just don't like that it exists. Like, this, like, oh, they're ramming it down our throats. No, they're existing. If you don't like it, go elsewhere. Like, I know lots of non-Christians who don't attend the Santa Claus parade in their town every Christmas. And yet they have yet to complain about how they're sick and tired of these events being forced upon them. Same basic issue, isn't it? It's a parade celebrating a certain group of people within society. Maybe it's to us LGBTQ people. Maybe it's people who wear red fur coats with white trim. Both good. But stop this. Nobody's making you go anywhere. Nobody's making you attend anything. There's just an event happening in your city and it's making you mad. The event's not the problem. You are. This person, like so many others, is making the exact same claim about 15-minute cities. Saying that in Edmonton, they won't not allow us to go to other neighborhoods, but they will charge people to go to different areas. No, they won't. They have been very specific that 15-minute cities are in no way going to impede your movement. So a challenge. If you can find for me, in the 15-minute cities documentation in Edmonton, anything that says that they are planning on charging you to leave your district, I will eat my toque. With a fork and knife, it'll be delicious. If you can prove to me that there is a stated plan to do this, to charge people to leave their neighborhoods, in the laws that have been passed in Edmonton, they aren't there, they don't exist. You are making this up. You are scared of a thing that you have invented. What else are you concerned about? Boogeymen? What are your feelings on chupacabras? Chupacabra? I don't know how to pluralize that one. Chupacabra. So this person's very angry that you can't call the liberals and the NDP leftists because they're not leftists. And said, well, then we need new language to discuss politics. I don't know what else to call them. You people get mad when we call them wokists. That's because wokist isn't a word. But also, what does woke mean? Like, in your mind, define woke. It's going to be something along the lines of having basic compassion for marginalized groups. And you're going to be furious about it. And it's the same problem with you labeling any political party you disagree with as leftist. Like, what is the point of focusing entirely on how to label something in order to best discredit it? You just want an excuse to ignore it. Like, those damn leftists and wokists. 
If you're going to yell that and then not know what those things mean, all that tells me is that your anger is rooted in nothing. It's just anger. Like, if you want to criticize the liberals or the NDP, do it. That's fine. How about we criticize them for what they're actually doing, what they actually believe, instead of just ascribing labels to them and then being furious about those labels? Damn those wokists! This person's talking about Pierre Poilievre and saying that they don't know that he's homophobic so much as he wants to stay on the good side of the sort of people you see commenting here on TikTok. So they're suggesting that it's not that he's homophobic, it's that he wants to cater to homophobes. You know that that's not better, right? Like, it's still real bad. Like, the options really are he does not support 2SLGBTQIA plus rights, or he does, but he's willing to put those personal beliefs aside for political convenience, to cater to his political base. So either he doesn't believe in human rights, or he's willing to suspend those beliefs when convenient. I don't know which one's worse, but they're both real bad. Like, this definitely does not get him a pass. Because if he isn't homophobic, but is willing to embrace homophobic policies, then he's homophobic. There's no secret third thing. 